Once upon a time, there was a girl who loved stories. Her name is Syra Shah, and she grew up in England not too long ago. Syra's father was a storyteller, and her childhood was filled with tales of another country, Afghanistan, a place over 3,000 miles away from her. Syra's father told her stories of the glorious city of Pakman, where their ancestors had once lived. In Pakman, there were gardens with flowers abloom and trees heavy with fruit. There were fountains flowing with healing waters, manicured paths through tree-lined streets and ornate buildings that gleamed in the sunlight against the backdrop of a vast mountain range. Cyrus' father told ancient folk tales that had been passed down by his own father and his grandfather before that. They were riddles disguising important lessons. Stories of magic and mystery, of heroes on quests, hidden treasures, talking animals and dervishes who are wise old men who saw and knew all. Her father's stories would blend together, so Syra never quite knew what was real and what was imagined. But they painted a picture of a land so beautiful, so full of magic and possibility, that Syra longed for this home that she had never seen and begged to hear his tales over and over again until she too knew them by heart. One of her favourite stories began long ago. On the first day of spring, the snow at the top of the Hindu Kush mountains began to thaw and a cold, icy stream was born, crystal clear and sparkling with newness. The stream raced excitedly down the mountainside, dancing and skipping towards the flatter lands below. The stream had but one wish, a desire it had been born with, which could not be ignored. The stream wished to travel as far as it might across the entire land, to the very edge of the earth, where it would meet with the waters of the great Arabian Sea. Syra's grandparents had been exiled from Afghanistan during World War II, and their property in Pakman had been divided up and given away. But Syra's father promised that one day they would leave England and return to their true home. Syra and her father planned their journey in great detail over and over again. They talked of all the sights they would see, the villages they would visit, and how their relatives in Pakman would celebrate their return with a great feast. They'd eat mountains of pilau, the traditional rice dish her father often cooked for them at home. In 1979, when Syrah was 15, the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan. This was not the first time the country had been invaded. Throughout all of history, many nations had tried to claim Afghanistan as their own. Even England, where her family now lived. There were men who fought against the Soviets called Mujahideen, and they gave up their jobs and lives to defend their land the best they could. But the Soviet army was larger and relentless. It seemed like a war that would never be won. Syrah was heartbroken. How could her family return home if their nation was destroyed 
and the people she longed to meet had been forced out. Sai Rajan, beloved, her father would say, I have given you the stories of our homeland. You will always have those. But the stories didn't satisfy Syra anymore. She made a decision. She would go to Afghanistan and see the country for herself. She needed to know which parts of her father's tales were true and to look for another side of herself in a place where she thought she would finally feel at home. A few years later, when she graduated from school, with Afghanistan still at war, Syra left her parents with only a note that told them that she was going to Afghanistan as a journalist to cover the war and would be back in one month's time. Syra claimed to be an experienced war reporter, though really, she wasn't anything of the sort, and she made plans to travel into the country and document the war with a group of Mujahideen warriors, all men of course, who had been staying in a refugee camp just across the border. They would travel in secret and to reach the nearest Afghan villages without being seen by the Soviet army, they would cross by foot over the treacherous Hindu Kush mountain range. She wasn't sure where they would go or what they might see, but she was determined to experience the country. The stream was joyful throughout its journey. At the base of the mountain was a fertile valley, green and glowing with spring. The stream's icy waters began to warm in the sunlight, and it jogged quickly along through open pastures and farmland. For a time, the stream joined with the waters of a racing river. Exhilarated by the current, it felt only excitement for its destination as it cut through bustling villages and rushes past a great city. Always the stream kept moving with one goal in mind. Not long into their climb, Syra began to feel dizzy and nauseous from the altitude. She had one guide she could talk with, but the rest of the Mujahideen were forbidden to speak with her, so she also felt quite lonely. When the exhausted group reached the top of the first peak, they let out a cheer and went stumbling and sliding down the snowy side of the mountain into a dark valley below. Shaking themselves off at the bottom, they looked ahead. There was another mountain peak to climb, this one even taller than the last. After crossing a rocky plateau, the stream found itself trickling through the dry heat of the Rajistan desert. The stream forced its way onward, winding through small cracks in the earth. But the temperature continued to rise, and the stream found itself sinking into the sands. The stream was desperate to finish its journey to the sea, but no matter how hard it tried to keep moving, it continued to sink and disappear. Exhausted, the stream began to doubt its destiny. Soon, 
Syra lost count of the days. Her food and water rations grew smaller, and she felt a hollow hunger and bitter thirst that she never had experienced before. Syra wasn't sure if she could keep moving, but like the stream in her father's story, Syra had a journey to complete. Eventually, the group came to a small mountain village, shining golden in the sunlight. The villagers rushed out to greet them and to offer food and shelter for the night. Syra and the Mujahideen were eager for a hot meal and rest, and the villagers were just as eager to hear news from the outside world. In this place, where roads and cars couldn't reach, visitors were rare. The village brought to life the sort of Afghanistan that Syra had always imagined, a place so quiet and peaceful it seemed like it could be part of a real fairy tale, the kind of place where magic might happen. The Mujahideen were invited into the formal visitors' rooms where they could compare notes on the current state of the war. The women of the village had their own quarters. In many rural parts of Afghanistan, it was custom that women would not speak with men who were not a part of their immediate or extended family. So they created a space for women only where they could relax and talk together. Syra followed the women into their cosy hut. As she looked around, everything she saw felt strangely familiar. From the embroidered cushions on the floor, to the smells and the bubbling pots on the fire, to the chickens pecking in the dust just outside the door. Syra could easily imagine another version of her life, one where her family had never been exiled, one where a village like this was her home. But the women stared at Syra, wide-eyed, as if she was a strange creature. Who was this woman who was dressed in men's clothing and travelled with a group of rough mujahideen through the wilderness? And why was she here? The fleeting sense of belonging that Syra had been feeling began to fade. She wanted to ask them everything about their lives, to understand how it felt to live in this country, how it felt to be truly Afghan. But first, she answered their questions about who she was, what it was like to grow up in England, to be a journalist, and to freely travel the world. Syra began to realise that as wonderful and mystical life in Afghanistan was to Syra, so the idea of her life was to them. The women in the village worked so hard, managing the farming, the cooking, the upkeep of their homes. It was an exhausting amount of work, but they were strong and capable and Syra admired them and knew their determination and strength was equal to hers. They stayed for just one night, and as they journeyed on, Syra worried that as the war continued, it would even reach the little village, that soon the Afghanistan of her father's stories would completely disappear. Just then, a quiet voice whispered in the breeze. There is a way you may cross. The voice was coming from the desert itself. It had been watching the stream and helping when it could. You must travel with the wind. But how? asked the stream. The wind can move through the sky, but I must stay on the ground. You must evaporate, the voice answered. 
into a fine mist, and the wind will carry you. When you reach the edge of the desert, you may come back to the earth again as rain. The stream was hesitant. It did not know what it would feel like to evaporate, nor to become rain. Would I be the same stream once I returned to the earth? The stream asked. You will never be the same. But if you do not change, you will never reach the sea. Syra traveled to Afghanistan many times over many years, writing and filming the things that she saw. War continued to come to Afghanistan, and each time the country was invaded, the Afghan people lost freedoms, especially the women. Syra returned because she wanted to show the rest of the world what was happening to the Afghan people. Though being a woman, she had to go in disguise. Sometimes she dressed as a young man. Sometimes she hid her face under a hooded robe called a burqa. The stream struggled to make a decision, trying to imagine evaporation and how that might feel. A hazy memory skirted into sight. It was a feeling of weightlessness, of letting go. The stream wondered if perhaps it might have done this before. The stream put its trust in the desert's words and allowed the heat to pull it upwards into the air, one tiny droplet at a time. As the stream evaporated, the wind began to move the droplets across the sky. The stream traveled as mist for miles and miles, and it tried to hold on to the memory of where it had come from and of what it had been. But the stream had changed, as the desert had warned. And when it fell gently to the ground as fresh rain, it formed into a new stream, one that eventually find its way to the sea. Cyrus' family history tied her to the people and the land of Afghanistan. Her father's stories were a celebration of her rich heritage. But she was also English. There she'd been born and raised and formally educated. What Syra realized over time was that she didn't have to choose one nationality. She could have both. She learned to appreciate the differences and the similarities between her two cultures and to be thankful for the things she had inherited from each. Syra's work documenting her travels helped to open the eyes of those living in other, safer lands to the real plight of the people of Afghanistan. Her documentaries told true stories of women and children suffering from years of oppression and the dangers of war. In this way, Syra became a part of the tradition she had inherited, the tradition of storytelling. Miles away from the sea, the desert smiled knowingly. It had seen the stream traveling through many spring thaws. So it knew that the water was always changing, always, always learning about who it was, where it had come, come from, and who it could come to be.
This podcast is a production of Rebel Girls. It's based on the book series Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. This story was produced by Juliana Mayo with sound design and mixing by Mumble Media. It was written by Emily McManwate, fact checking by Joe Radigan, with sensitivity read by Rabia Amadi. Narration by Joan Griffith and Amy Selma. Thank you to the whole Rebel Girls team who make this podcast possible. Stay Rebel!